Welcome to the V Brown Bag podcast, where we talk about all things IT. We get to know and talk with experienced and fun and smart people in various technical industries. And tonight, we are going to be talking about something that is near and dear to my heart, the how and why of infrastructure as code with the illustrious, the illuminous, the retired dolphin masseuse, Ben Kehoe. I still don't. I still don't understand where that's coming from. I, um, I was just randomly picking like, what are the most hilarious? I was thinking of like, like post Nobel laureate, or I was I was trying to come up with stuff, and I was like, what's funnier than somebody that massages dolphins and then retires from that? I mean, my understanding of dolphins hmm? um, means that that is not a job that I would want to have. Ah. I, I have I have no uh, other other than seeing <laughs> Flipper as a kid. I don't okay, have any we'll, kind of. We'll, uh, we'll take that offline. I just want to. Oh, like, yeah. Is it naughty? It's not naughty, is it? It, it is. Oh. It is. It is. Oh no! Uh, <laughs> and not great. And not great. Um, dolphins are not are not um, uh, nice animals. Let's put it that way. Um, I was, oh no! Would you stop? I mean, you... <laughs> most nature is not nearly as nice as 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 our perceptions are of it, um, and dolphins are up there in that in that category of animal. <laughs> However, what was oh, no. the other one? You you had another one in a more recent tweet. We can go with. Oh, um, it was it was on it was on LinkedIn, and I accused you of being a. I mean, former vacuum salesman is true. Yeah, but but that's an actual true thing. I didn't I didn't yeah. want to actually say something for real. I want I wanted that's, to say that's, something. That's the one I go with. All right, exactly. But it's uh, people would be like, oh wait, I robot. I get that. That's fine. That's okay. Okay, you want something I was more I wanted truly outlandish. Okay. And now I forget. Oh, here it is. Um, inimitable social butterfly. That is also false. Yes, exactly. Um. Yes, it is very false. <laughs> For those that don't I, know, Ben Ben yeah. is a bit of an introvert. I'm, I'm he is the friendly. opposite of me. Yeah. I'm friendly, but I'm not. I'm not. You know, I don't go to replay at reInvent. Um, you, you are much more uh, comfortable I'm with one-on-one -on -one interactions. Yeah. Like like me and you drinking at a bar together in a quiet place, way more fun than trying to shout over a bar. That's that's just nonsense. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Totally. When the three of us hang out together, it will be in a quieter place. I promise. Yeah, I mean there are many of them in Las Vegas, um, but uh, you have we'll to pay a corner. premium to find a quiet place in Vegas. Yeah, that that is quiet. That's, Silence that's is the you. most valuable yes. commodity in Vegas. <laughs> Charlotte, have have you been to Vegas at all, or is this your first trip to Vegas completely? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. Yeah, my mic was acting up. Um, no, this will be my first time going to Vegas. I've flown over it. I That's better. Went, yeah, I once, like, what, just like two, three weeks ago, I uh, had a layover there. And as I was waiting to get on a plane, these two ladies literally started fist fighting in line. Sounds about right. It's Vegas. Yeah, it was early in the morning. And I was like, you know, so available. Too early for this. Money or something. Yeah. Tensions were high. It is. Were, they, were there already several place. drinks in? I mean, it's, it's Vegas, so they usually Probably. start drinking around 6 a.m. Yeah. Probably. That's uh, my guess. So you are in for an absolute treat. Not only are you visiting Vegas, you're visiting Vegas for a reInvent conference. Yeah. So it's it's double the fun, double the double the insult to your to your senses. Well, there's very little. I mean, yes, there's. There's very little that I would go to Las Vegas for, and reInvent is at the top of the list. True. Yes, and, and that's literally the only reason I go there. If if there were other conferences, I'd be like, okay, I'm going to fly in for the keynote and then my talk, and then I'm going to leave. For reInvent, I come in on, on Sunday, hang out with the heroes, do the things, and then leave on Friday. That's, 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 and, and honestly, Vegas is a three-day town. After, after day oh, I, three, you're yeah. done. You're no, toasted. boy. Okay. All right. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the <laughs> let's, let's try this again from the top. Um, so before we get into it, let's uh, do a couple of quick show notes. Please feel free to get in on the conversation. If you are in the studio audience 
and you are not feel comfortable chatting, um, you can at V Brown bag or hashtag V Brown bag on Twitter, Mastodon threads. We are in all the spaces um, and we will happily answer your questions there or retroactively after, after everything's been canned, we'll put it, we're going to post this on YouTube and you can ask the questions there. Our guest tonight is Ben Kehoe. You can find him at Ben one, one Kehoe on Twitter Ben, is there any other place that you prefer to be seen at now, now that the hell site is turning into an even worse place? I mean, not really. Um, Mm. I'm on Blue Sky and Mastodon at mastodon.cloud with the same handle for both. Um, Mm. Also on LinkedIn. Um, Yeah, you can find me. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, if, if you Google Ben Kehoe, I robot. Not on threads. You'll, 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 all the, all the things will pop up. I am the number one Ben Kehoe in a Google search now. I think it nice. used to be an artist. Um, oh yeah, which I am not. Um, but I think what, what, I what did he do? What him. was he an artist of? Uh, I mean, weird. There's a lot of really weird stuff, uh, which I appreciate. Like the nose flute, um, or <laughs> oh, oh, of painting. Oh, um, oh, painting. Okay, of painting. But weird subjects that were weird, um, and it's it's calmed down a little in 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 his in his later years, I guess. Um, his early period was a lot more esoteric. Interesting. Interesting. I will never ever be the top one hundred Chris Williamses in in that's a true. Search. That's that is that is, a, a, that is a high bar. I I am the only Mistwire though. I'm like like literally the first three pages oh, of, yeah. of Mistwire heads. So well, I wasn't the first Ben Kehoe on Twitter. Hence having to come up with something <laughs> with the um, ones. Well, so it's a numero I, nim, you know, like I eighteen n. Like there's eleven letters in my full name missing from that. I I legit thought that Ben like it was like a takeoff of Ben ten. Like you were trying to do Ben no. ten, but somebody already had Ben ten Kehoe, so you went with Ben eleven. Key- I don't. I don't. I was like. What? <laughs> But then, then I realized you probably have never watched a cartoon in your entire life. <laughs> so I think I have seen there was a Ben 10 video game shown to me by a child of a friend. Gotcha. So I'm at least aware that that is a thing that exists. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. It's, it's a good show. <laughs> between between my 10 net. How many nephews do I have now? I have five sisters. So I have a morass, a, a huge amount of children uh, mm-hmm. to to be uncle um, to. So I've, I've seen all the things I'm currently watching Moana with uh, with my goddaughter. So that's, oh, yeah. that's the that's the current thing. Right I have now. seen that. Yeah. Oh, OK, cool. All There's right. a chicken that they got a famous actor to be a chicken in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am going to uh, stop presenting. Uh, ben, did you have anything that you wanted to like actually present or are we going to have a conversation about it? Are we going to, how, how are we doing this I mean, tonight? How well, do you want to do this? I do have a set of slides. Okay. Those, those slides are purely like subject headers. Sure. So if, if there's no need to put them up, I don't need to put them up. We, uh, we can, we can throw them up and use them as conversation okay. starters and, and uh, all the things. Well, is that just going to, okay, let's see here. Um, Unless you feel like it would detract from the conversation. I'm just thinking about whether I can see while I'm doing it. Um, So if I do this and then I tab over here, can I? Shashala, I I literally like five seconds before we started figured out, remember all that presentation issues I was having on the last episode? Yeah. I I finally figured out how to do it just with one screen. And yeah, it was a, it was a whole thing. It took me like 15 minutes. And then you're on Mac too on that at that, right? That was the sticking point. I could yeah. do it all day long on, on Windows. Mac was what threw me off. Apparently uh, someone says that there's a good Ben 10 in InfoSec. Um, but I appear to be one better than him. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> you are a plus so, one of the Ben yes. 10 in InfoSec. Yeah. Nice. Um, so can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay. Uh, so like I said, I don't, these are just really um, section headers. And so people may want to pin our three videos um, to, to, because uh, it will be more interesting looking at our faces, I think. 
Um, and if I can get it to go. Um, so for people who don't know me, uh, there's not a lot to know, I think. Um, I'm an AWS serverless hero. Uh, I was That's at iRobot um, for about seven years. Um, over there, I was doing, you know, sort of bleeding edge of serverless. iRobot has no containers or VMs in production for the primary system that supports the Roomba fleet. So it's all purely serverless. Um, and uh, I left iRobot uh, almost a year ago, a year ago in a couple of weeks. Um, and uh, um, to take some time off, decide what's next for me. It has turned out that that is a job at uh, Siemens in Germany, which I'm starting in the new year. Um, and uh, so I care about a lot of things. Um, I'm a serverless hero. They only let you be one kind of hero. Uh, but I also like identity and security, <laughs> infrastructure as code, IoT, uh, many of these different topics. Um, uh, but all of it is serverless in that I want to use more managed services. I want to get more responsibilities off my plate so I can focus on what business value I'm creating um, for uh, for the customer. And so I first want to talk about the term infrastructure as code. Uh, for anyone who has never heard of it, um, we'll get into uh, exactly what some of those words mean um, and what they don't mean and what they should mean. Um, but in general, we're talking about uh, having some artifact that represents what we're going to deploy into our systems, whether that's on-prem, cloud, hybrid, whatever. The, the concept is around capturing what you want your system to look like in a way that allows you to have safer, more reliable deployments and uh, deployment management process. Uh, there are lots of different tools to do that. You know, you go back a while and we'll talk a little bit about this, Chef and Puppet and Ansible. Uh, and now, you know, um, we talk about things like CloudFormation for AWS, uh, unless you're Chris Williams, in which case you talk about Terraform. <laughs> um, uh, and if you're on GCP, um, there's no CloudFormation. There's no, there's no comparison to CloudFormation. There is Terraform for you. Um, Shablam. <laughs> and uh, there's also, you know, Pulumi and um, there's other tools, um, the CDK, the AWS CDK Cloud Development Kit. We'll also talk about a, a bit about how Kubernetes does this, all of these things. My purpose tonight is not to talk about uh, what the tools are and compare and contrast them, but rather to talk about how to think about why we would want to use any of these tools in the first place and then how to understand what these tools do and therefore select between the trade-offs that they present you. So the first thing that I wanna talk about is the first word in the term, which is infrastructure, uh, because I don't like it, or at least I think it's, it's not as applicable as it used to be. So the term infrastructure, right? Uh, infra means below, like infrared, is wavelengths below the red spectrum of light. Infrastructure is the structure that's below things. And you contrast that with like superstructure. And so when we talk about infrastructure, it's generally something where there's sort of a dividing line between it and the things that go on top of it. You think about a bridge is, an inf is infrastructure for the road that goes on top of it. And the road is infrastructure as part of our transportation network. And the transportation network is infrastructure for our society. And in some of those cases, there are you know, pretty clear dividing lines that you can build a bridge and then pave on top of it. And those are two separate things. You know, you have to take into account how much traffic is going to carry, but you don't have to, you know, they're not uh, intermixed. Uh, whereas if you go all the way up to sort of transportation as a, uh, um, if you go all the way up to transportation as part of our society, well, the people who are engaged in the business of transportation, the business of construction, all of those, that's part of our economy. Our economy uses transportation. There's no, you know, 
bright line where you can say, oh, here's the thing that's the transportation sector of it. And then here's all the rest of the stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you move from, you know, this, this kind of thing where sure infrastructure is a term, but often it comes with this implication of this separation, but that separation isn't always there. If we look at software and the things that we do now, you can go to the traditional thing where uh, if you're on-prem, you know, your the electricity grid is infrastructure for your data center. And in your data center, your servers are infrastructure for the things that are deployed onto them. And there's a pretty clear dividing separation there, especially because you know the procurement cycles are much longer than the deployment cycles on top of them. And um, the level of management, the level of physical management, which is very different as a job from uh, putting software on servers, there is a pretty clear dividing line. You move that into the cloud and you do a lift and shift and maybe that line sort of stays there and you say, oh, well, the people who create the EC2 instances and set up the VPCs and all of that, well, that's infrastructure for the applications that we deploy on top. Mm -hmm. But it starts to break down because EC2 is a service. It is a service just like all these other services on AWS like SQS. And so when your code sits on an EC2 instance, sure, maybe that ma the management of those two things can be separated. But if your code sends a message into an SQS queue that is then read by another piece of your code, uh, well, it's not, SQS doesn't sit below. That's in line with your things. There's not a clear dividing line, even though the API to SQS and the API to EC2 are, you know, in the same SDK, mm -hmm. right? And you can even go further than that and say, well, that's, you know, a, a, an orchestration service like Step Functions sort of sits above all of the pieces of code that it manages, that it's orchestrating. And so when you start to get more cloud native, you start to break down these notions of, oh, this is the things that are below, that sit beneath and need to be managed separately and start to talk about um, how we do these things uh, together. And so I tend to talk about these things as resources, that you have a collection of resources that you need to manage, and they're connected together in a graph, right? You interlink these resources, whether they're pieces, you know, code that's running that you've developed or services that you're using, or code running services that are running your code. And you may be able to draw lines across that graph of resources and say, oh yeah, there's a pretty clean separation here and we'll delegate out that um, the management of those two things to separate groups. But the more cloud native you are, the harder that is. Mm -hmm. And the more that the term infrastructure gets used in those contexts carries with it this baggage of it shouldn't be my responsibility. I shouldn't have to care about it or think about it. But the more that they're intermingled, the more you do have to think about it, the more you, you know, an SQS queue isn't something you can abstract away because you have to care about how it's going to work for you and how it's distinguished from other options like SNS or Kinesis. And so you have to care more about the properties of that thing than you do about, you know, the network on which an EC2 instance is running, right? Those things can be more abstracted away. Um, so I tend to talk about resource graphs and things like this. Um, and I try to avoid using the term infrastructure with the implication that, oh, this is something you shouldn't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, and I do see that happen sometimes in, in the conversation around infrastructure as code of like, oh, we manage the infrastructure so, so you don't have to. And it's like, well, by calling it infrastructure, you're inherently implying that it sh sh it's beneath the developer sort of, and that's sort of begging the question. You're sort of implying that it does need to be taken away. And I don't think that's always the case. Um, and so we've got, if we consider the systems that we build as collections of resources, graphs of resources, uh, you have to manage those things over time, both to create them in the first place and then update them over time. And a very long time ago, you know, that was done only manually. Um, that uh, you are SSHing into servers, um, or even you know before that 
you were RSHing into servers. <laughs> um, and uh, um, you were manually updating the code. And then as, as those things started to grow and you had large fleets of servers, okay, well, I need to automate my SSHing into servers. And so you start getting into scripting and things like this, and you start to build out those tasks. And uh, so that is generally done in a very custom way, is done you know, by an individual person or by an organization, and they build up expertise around, this is exactly how we do this. It's not very transferable. It tends to be very brittle. Um, and so we started moving towards, well, what's a way um, that we can do this um, in a more principled way that that allows us to actually, you know, abstract out the business of making those changes and be more in, in the business of defining what changes need to happen. Mm. And so this is where we started to get tools like Chef and Puppet um, that said, okay, you can define some sort of state that you need. You can define some collection of operations that you want to perform. And then there can be a system, a, a generalized system that can carry out those operations in a way that's standardized across your machines, that does all the things that you need to take into account. Now, a lot of that is still driven in that world by the needs of servers that, uh, you know, often these are servers that are closer to pets than cattle. And mm -hmm. so you need things like, oh, I need to restart this server. I don't need to get rid of it and bring a new one up like I might do with an EC2 instance, but rather it's got some state on it that I want preserved, but I need to power cycle it or, you know, stop and start the instance again so that the things that are running on it get refreshed in the right way and those kind of things. Um, and I'll come back to some of those needs later as we get towards, you know, what the current and future state is. Um, but as we move forward through that, we started getting, okay, well, what if we don't, if we start treating these things as immutable resources, so we are getting rid of them rather than curating them over time and just replacing them. And so as we start doing that, we need ways of defining the state that we wanted, the operations that we wanted to do. And this gets to the other word in the term that I'm not necessarily very happy with, which is code. It's another word that carries a lot of baggage with it. So you're not happy with infrastructure and you're not happy with code. <laughs> yeah. Are you are you okay with as or is that I'm right okay out? with as. You know what I'm not okay, okay All right. with is from. Ah! Uh, uh, right. which I don't think I'll get into tonight. Um, I was gonna say we, we don't have the right AWS hero on to to refute that. Um, um Mr. Jeremy Daly is not here. Yes, there are others. It's not it's not unique uh to to Jeremy, but uh um uh and really the from is more reinforcing some of these pieces and so code is you know uh another word that carries a lot of baggage with it that that uh our industry has had a lot of toxic conversations about what is and isn't code and what it means to uh be a coder or not be a coder and you know i also don't think there's a bright line that you can define around what is code and what is not. It is a thing that you put in a computer to make it do stuff um, that may or may not be textual. Um, uh, and uh, so in this context, what's important is that it is an artifact. That is something that you can, you know, point to and have as a as a thing um, that you can say, this is my instructions for deploying this, you know, this set of resources or managing this set of resources. It's something that you can put into version control. Um, it's something that uh, you can diff ideally. Um, again, whether that's a textual diff or something else is, is open for interpretation. Um, but it's really about saying, you know, we're not gonna do this in a way that is not repeatable. Right, we're going to do this in a way that is repeatable, that is versioned, that we can, in theory, 
you know, say this was a previous thing that we wanted. We now want it again. Um, that you can have the same artifact used in different places. So you can say, we did this in our dev environment. Now we're using the exact same thing and we're doing it in the test environment. Now we're using the exact same thing and we're using it in the production environment. That's the important thing of this part of, you know, as code is as an artifact for defining how we want it. So when we look at this all together, we say, okay, great. We want to define the state of our deployed system. And we want to give that to an engine that will go and make that a reality. And so we don't have to concern ourselves with the, the exact um, planning out of here are the, all the operations that will make that true. We can have something, this generalized engine that will do that for us. Hmm. And we'll do that in a way that then allows us um, to have these artifacts that do it and create and create them as resource graphs. So now we get into, okay, but what does that actually look like? And there are many different flavors of this. And so some of these different flavors, um, you know, a big one uh, is declarative or imperative. How do you want to define that state that you want to see? And in a declarative language, you say, this is the state. And generally in an imperative language the the infrastructure's code tools that take imperative approaches say write a program that will output a declarative state and we'll get to how that affects some of these further down things in a second uh, for both of those options there are different languages right often the imperative ones uh use general purpose uh, Turing complete familiar imperative programming languages to be user friendly. Uh, there aren't really any uh, uh, really widely used declarative state languages. And so all of them tend to be specific to a tool or something. Um, I would note that YAML and JSON are not languages, they are syntaxes <laughs> in which languages can be written. Um, because uh, the language is defined by both the syntax and the semantics. And so uh, uh, the, the, the language is cloud formation. The language is not YAML. Um, you can either have it client-side or cloud-based. Um, for some tools, uh, like Terraform, you have an option of both. Um, uh, you can have it deterministic or have it allow non-determinism. Um, and for any uh, tool that allows non-deterministic behavior, you can generally, I don't think there are any that force you to have non-deterministic behavior. That would be a little weird. Uh, and then there are platform specific or not. Um, and I generally uh, um, think, uh, you know, Terraform is, is big on this. Um, Michael has said, you know, talked about multi-cloud as sort of, it's not about workload portability. It's about tools that can do platform specific things, but for multiple platforms. Uh, that in Terraform, Terraform, the client, right, is not itself multi-cloud in, you are not defining an abstracted set of resources that can be deployed to either cloud, you're using an AWS provider or you're using a GCP provider. And so if you know Terraform you and you know AWS, well, then you can create an AWS specific thing. And if you know Terraform and you know GCP, you can do a GCP specific thing. Mm -hmm. If you're moving from AWS to GCP or vice versa, and you know one, you only have to learn the new things on the platform. You don't have to learn an entire new tool in order to do those things. And so that's, you know, sort of the non-platform specific version. There are also IAC tools that attempt to give you an abstraction over the platform to say, you say you need a queue and it figures out what kind of queue that is based on where you are deploying it. Um, so that's, I guess there's sort of three varieties in, in that last bullet point. Mm -hmm. um, I have lots of opinions on all of these. Really? Uh, so I think um, 
when you look at declarative versus imp imperative, uh, this also comes to deterministic versus non-deterministic, is the value in a deterministic um, artifact is you know exactly what you're getting, right? And you can you can understand why, oh, there's some cleverness you can do with non-determinism. I have to go reach out to some other uh, service during my deployment to go find out some information. And with that, that will make this work easier for me. You know, a, a good example with that in, in AWS and especially in CloudFormation is like uh, the latest version of a parameter store, Secrets Manager Secret. But now you have a thing where if you deploy it, it does different things if you deploy it at different times. Mm -hmm. And there's no way for you to specifically say, I want exactly the thing I had before. And so I'm a strong believer in determinism. I think that you it uh, the useful thing is to separate your non-deterministic steps and your deterministic steps to say, oh, I'm going to go do this, getting my parameter versions as a separate step in my deployment pipeline, package that up as a little JSON artifact that I can go put in a store somewhere, and then add that as parameters into my uh, CloudFormation template or my Terraform plan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, similarly, on the declarative versus imperative, Im an imperative program uh, doesn't tell you exactly what's going to be created. It implicitly defines a state through the execution of the program. And of course, if it's Turing complete, uh, it is an unknowable state. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it it is not a state that can be you know, statically analyzed out of the program. And so I, I prefer something that that is declarative and is especially is not Turing complete. Something that you know can directly represent those things. You need a rich um, declarative language. You know, a, a thing that I that I point to is uh you want to be able to say, I need a subnet in every availability zone. <laughs> and what you don't want is that the resolved thing that you go put in the cloud says, here's three subnets, and they happen to be in each availability zone. What you want to do is that the final thing that ends up in the cloud is a thing that says, here's a collection of subnets, one for every availability zone. You want that intent fully represented. And that's on the infrastructure's code. Sir, like this is on CloudFormation to provide that ability, right? To represent that. Or if you're not managing it through CloudFormation on um, whatever tool to say, yeah, we've actually carried through that complex representation and not flattened it out. And so that's where, you know, declarative shouldn't be, oh, I'm just listing resources. It should be, here's here's my complex system that I want. Um, and uh, so then on the client side versus cloud-based, I'm of course very strong on the cloud-based side. It mm. is serverless. Um, I don't want to be responsible for managing the state. Um, <laughs> you know, that uh, the best part about cloud-based infrastructure as code is exactly that, that it is a service, that the responsibility for the correctness of the behavior of it is not my problem. Mm -hmm. That the responsibility for maintaining that software that does it to make sure that it is correct, up to date, all of those things, is the responsibility of, of whoever is providing it to me. And therefore, that is just one less thing I have to worry about. Um, the platform specific versus not, I'm, you know, uh, again, being serverless, I'm not a big believer in being platform independent. I think you want to use. Uh, as much of the unique capabilities of the platform that you're on. But that doesn't mean that there isn't value in tools that understand multiple platforms. Like sure. that can yeah. be valuable. And that's, I think, an organizational question of saying every organization of sufficient size is going to be is going to be using multiple clouds at different places. Mm -hmm. 
if you've got teams that don't really need to interact with each other, don't really have a lot of governance in common, the value of having a single tool that works for all of those teams, not very high. Right. On the other hand, if you get people moving between those teams a lot mm -hmm. and uh, you've got similar workloads running, you know, it's all sort of chosen kind of like that. And you've only got one security team that's got to look over everybody's stuff, the value in saying everyone's using the same tool. So it's all expressed the same way. It's all, you know, you can understand it more easily across the this organization. Right. That's going to be more valuable. So there isn't one answer there. Um, but that's how I sort of think about that platform specific or not for infrastructure as code um, piece. Uh, finally, sort of in, in what I'd like to see that isn't really there. Um, you know, again, I'm a strong believer in declarative infrastructure as code. And uh, I also think that visual building is the is the far future of infrastructure as code. I think that if you ask somebody, what does their system look like? The first thing they do is draw you a diagram. Mm -hmm. Why is that not the way you just define your system? Um, you always have to make a diagram for, uh, um, for your wiki. Why not start with that <laughs> and have that be the artifact? That hmm. not, oh, this turns into something, right? Again, these artifacts don't have to be textual inherently. Um, you know, why not? I've just drawn the diagram that represents the thing. And I've got a tool that helps me do that, right? Because I will need to say, oh yeah, these resources I group together in some sort of, uh, you know, grouping. This is a service or whatever. And let me zoom out and those will all collapse into one box kind of a thing, right? It's not, oh, here's a static picture, but rather a, you know, visual canvas for letting me define these things. And I've yet to see an architecture that, won't actually work that way. Um, you know, there are definitely, you know, only once you start getting into like supercomputer topology kind of thing of like, oh yeah, we've got, you know, this is our bus and it's torus shaped. Um <laughs> is is the kind of thing that would be hard to hard to, you know, draw out on a whiteboard. Mm. Um uh on the other hand, kind of the 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 other you know, the the counterpoint to that is sort of the direction that um, Adam Jacobs is going with uh, System Initiative, which says, oh, the artifact is not actually the thing. Instead, let's have a system that understands our system. So sort of a meta system that can look into it mm -hmm. and manage it in ways. And this is a little bit um, like how sort of Kubernetes controllers work. You know, in the sense of I define what I want and there's something that attempts to make that locally true, but is not in a way that we have a snapshot across everything that we're versioning in a linear way. Um, and there's some interesting consequences that I've seen of how a system initiative works that handles things that are sort of hard in uh, infrastructure as code. So an example is I need to reboot this server after I do this operation. It's not a thing that that a snapshot, a resource graph can really communicate well. Hmm. But if you consider it as, hey, I've laid out this chain of operations that the system understands need to take effect and it's got this whole thing to do it, um, that can handle that much more naturally. So there's some interesting directions there. I'm not fully sold on it, but I think there's there's definitely interesting ideas over there. And I think that's it. Uh, in terms of the the prepared stuff that I wanted to talk about, yeah, it's your 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 comments um, really spur a lot of um, memories from like my my back when I was an enterprise architect. I want I want to say this was, and I and I don't know if it's still happening nowadays, but large enterprises when they talk to a company like WWT or Green Pages or other places that I've worked at, they, they were always invariably, yes, we want to be multi-cloud. And yes, we want to be able to do the exact same things in every single cloud. Yeah. And I'm like, no. Well, mm -hmm. so so it, we, we would start with that conversation and then we would have to work backwards. Yeah. Because, well, this is where I bring up cow tipping. Oh? 
Yes. Tell, so tell me more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so if people are not familiar, cow tipping is sort of an urban legend about people in rural areas uh, in the U.S. Uh, getting bored, and and when they get bored, uh, a thing that they might do drunk on a Friday night <laughs> is go out and tip over cows, push cows so that they fall over. And to and be clear, this is an urban legend. This doesn't actually happen. You can't actually well, tip over is, a cow, right? Well, this is the thing. It was, okay. it was an urban legend because for a long time, no one really knew for sure, can you tip right. over a cow or not? And But there's easy proof that you cannot, which is that there are no videos of it on YouTube. <laughs> you can do because the math of... as well. And people have done and said, you know, all, you know, also cows, they don't sleep standing up. They sleep lying down. Mm. Um, uh, so you can't sneak up on a cow that way. They can also just step to the side. There's lots of reasons that cow tipping isn't a real thing. But the easy proof of it is if people went out cow tipping, there'd be people would be taking videos of it and posting it to thousands YouTube. of videos, especially from Florida. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is also the, you know, crop circle UFO things of, you know, a lot of those sightings went way down when camera phones when, started when, dr thing. when drone photography became a thing, all yeah. of that just went away. It's so weird. Yeah. When you start <laughs> to be able to prove it. Um, yeah. And similarly with multi-cloud people talk about, Oh, this is, um, you know, we need to go multi-cloud because these are the risks that we think mm. of being locked into a provider. And there, you see many people out saying that. You see very few companies out there with their stories of how their multi-cloud strategy saved them from disaster. Right. And so it is a form of insurance. You are paying a higher cost in, in terms of not monetary cost necessarily sometimes, but... Uh, in terms of velocity, in terms of value you're getting for what you're paying for, by making all these things easy to port from mm -hmm. one cloud to another, in order to protect yourself, that's the premium you're paying. The, right. the claim you want to file is, I need to move from one provider to another. And nobody files any claims. And so it's it's not something that's actually worth putting that effort into. And even when you see companies that are doing it, like Spotify moved from AWS to GCP a couple of years ago. Mm. And if you see what they were doing, um, the uh, um, it's not, oh, we learned our lesson and we're doing all this provider independent stuff, platform independent stuff on GCP. No, they're all in on GCP as they should be. If they have to move again, they'll pay that cost, but the likelihood is low and the value they'll be getting in the meantime more than pays for that. Graham points out is also a negotiation tactic with cloud providers. It mm. was a better negotiation tactic with traditional enterprise vendors that used lock-in to raise prices. That's not a thing that cloud platforms do today. And so it's not, you know, um, it's not, generally a useful tactic at most people's scales. Hmm. Yeah, it, I mean, and, and you're right, because when we were building data centers and, you know, it was Dell or HP or, or even back Compaq back in the day, yeah. um, <laughs> that, I mean, they, they built an entire ecosystem around the care and feeding and maintenance of those things. Yes. But that, but you could uninstall and reinstall on a different set of boxes with, with the cloud, you can, you can even more easily with, with more facility, create a pipe to a new place for your ones and zeros to live. And, and, and I mean, there, there'd still be the, the overhead of, so when, when I think of these things, I think of them from like the sysops. So I, you come from code. I come from, you know, actually running underneath the, the, the cables and, and, do, and fire, firebring everything up. So my perspective of infrastructure as code is, is from that perspective. When, when I'm building a thing using Terraform or CloudFormation or whatever like that, I'm thinking of it from that layer. When I'm assuming when you build something, you're thinking of it from the, okay, like application, you think it application down, I think of it hard drives up basically. Yeah. Same here. Well, um, well, I hope never to have hard drives to manage. Um, Good. <laughs> uh, just, you know, just S3. S3 and ephemeral storage. Um, uh, 
Yeah, I think um, you know, even in that world, I think cloud cloud providers and and a good deal of of modern cloud software vendors have <laughs> realized that it's a better business to try and enable you to spend more with them rather than try and get you to pay more for the same thing. Right. And the rise of, you know, uh, serverless usage-based billing kind of concepts mean that it's not, you know, with enterprise, traditional enterprise software is often, well, here's the contract for, you know, the seats that you have. And we're raising the prices because we've got new features, but well, are you using the features, all this stuff? If the more you go towards services that have, you know, uh, fine grain billing, well, great. They've launched a feature. If you use it, you'll pay for it, that kind of a thing. And so again, and honestly, uh, that's more intuitive too, because you're, you're paying for what you're using as opposed to being billed a flat rate. And then, well, it depends because the flat rate is predictable and predictability has value. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's true. That was one thing that I encountered at iRobot was being a traditionally hardware company that was just entering the connected product space. And so only now dealing with sort of the variable costs that come along with that used to like long lead times on, hey, we've bought, you know, X million capacitors kind of a right. thing. And right. You know exactly how much that's going to cost you for the next three years. Going to a system where you're like, well, we think it's going to cost something like this. Mm -hmm. was a big transition for the finance people. Oh yeah. No, same, same yeah. for all hardware buyers were like, yeah. what um, per month? Outrageous. I, I want my <laughs> three year billing cycle and my end of life yeah. and all that stuff. Well, and so, and so having that, that ability to say, oh, this is what exactly what it's going to cost. And we know that it's not going to be over that mm -hmm. does have value to businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's not the fine grain billing is not a, uh, unalloyed good, right? There are some trade-offs to sure. it. When, once you get into the, um, I've been on this side of it too long. I, the, I, the CFO I, side, <laughs> yeah, will start. Will the complexity start getting in? Oh, I can amortize it against this. You know all of that. And when you say, "Well, I don't know how much it's going to cost yet," mm -hmm. they, they say, don't oh, like well, that. I, I don't. I don't have all those tools. The, yeah. Then you don't have any money. What? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um, let me scrape through here for some questions. Tons, tons of statements. Uh, yeah. You won't use it before you pay for something additional and recently have billing. Um, Charlotte, did, did you see any questions in here? I, I've, I've been really crappy about paying attention. I apologize. No, folks. no, you're good. I've been watching um, more so uh, statements. Like you said, I haven't hmm. seen like any questions, just opinions. Nice. Good opinions. Hmm. Oh no, Graham! Saying I'll oh, shut up. Why you're doing fine, Graham? Graham, you're doing fantastic. One of these days, we're going to get you to present. Yes. Nice. All right. Well, um, we we are at the at time, so perfect timing, Ben. Job right. well done. Um, right. Are you doing? So you're going to be at reInvent. Are you presenting at, at at any sessions? No. Any chalk talks? Any panel chats? No, and I will be on Peer Talk. Okay. Although I am yep. not a Peer Talk expert this year, mm. I was last year, mm. uh, but they didn't pick me. I guess they didn't want me back. Um, was that? Uh, did we do that. To, was that the thing that we, you and I did together, or was that? I don't think so. So Peer Talk is this thing where you can connect with people to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. In the yeah. reInvent app, it's mm. really cool. I like it a lot. Um, it's neat. You can. Did, any, you know, did anybody? Did anybody grab you for those things? Oh yeah, I had a number of good conversations. Oh wow! Um, I had I had two, but it was people trying to sell me something. I was so mad. <laughs> yes, um, and I think they're trying to. You know, they know that's not like the AWS folks working on it. Know that that's not what they want it for. Mm. Um, and no, it's just people who wanted to talk about various things: infrastructure as code, serverless, nice. security, things like that. Um, and yeah, so it's a cool way to connect with people, um, especially experts. Um, also, if you see me in the hall or whatever, uh, feel free to reach out and just say, hey, 
because like I said, I'm, I, I am an introvert. I, 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 I like small settings, but I'm also friendly. <laughs> um, and you're easy so to find in a crowd too. Um, uh, somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll have a beard by that point. I think. Are you really you going to grow one? I always have a beard in the winter. Mm, okay. Nice. Yeah. I'm, I'm lazy. Mm. Uh, so I want a beard because it's less shaving, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but I get overheated in the summer. Gotcha. gotcha. So you're willing oh, to can't. put the work in at that point. Cause of the heat. yeah, I can't, I can't stand. I'll just be sweating all the time and, and irritable. And yeah. I am actually not allowed to get rid of my beard. Um, <laughs> there, there has been a household rule passed that Chris. Yeah, nobody likes your chin. Beard. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kim, uh, we, we were coming back from visiting my parents for, and my, my then girlfriend, now wife met my dad for the first time. And he and I are like spitting images of each other. Like, like he is me plus 30 years. And, uh, she was coming, we were coming back on the flight and he's, he's had a beard his, like, like ever since he retired from the military, he's, he grew a beard and that was it. He's, he's had it the entire time. So I was clean shaven at the time. She had spent the week with oh. me and my dad saw us side by side and on the flight back she's looking at me in, in profile and she's like you should grow a beard that's hilarious <laughs> and i was like all right well i guess we're gonna grow a beard i mean it's a little weird to hear i want you to look more like your dad <laughs> so i legit said oh, are you hot for my dad and and then she totally slapped me and uh yeah. and so then I, I grew the beard there we go it looks good oh, thank you goodness. i appreciate that i don't have a choice that's true. <laughs> Even if it looked terrible, she'd be like, nope, you're keeping it. Yep. <laughs> she's, she's the one that has to live with me. So she gets the final say. Aww. All right, folks. Well, thank you once again for joining us, Ben. It's a great. pleasure to always have a pleasure to have yeah, you this on. This is great. Um, super bummed that you don't live up here anymore because the Portsmouth user group is now starting to get back into the swing of things in person. So, oh yeah. So um, we're going to we've we've supplanted you with AJ and yep. Richard Boyd and Tom McLaughlin. I've, I've got three heroes to make up, well, but Jeremy's it's still, out there. still not enough. Jeremy's is he close by? Is he close enough? I should. Yeah, yeah. I think you He's might right be right. There, right? I yeah. should invite him to the Halloween party. Happy Halloween, everybody. I totally forgot about that. I've, I've uh, in on the intro slide. I actually put a little pumpkin in there. You did. I a, saw that. And I, and I found some I found some good motion video stuff for the uh, for the video. So we're going to have a spooktacular Halloween special. V Brown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, have yourselves right. a wonderful evening. Ben, always a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks Shala, so much. We're, we're all going to see each other in five weeks. I'm so excited about yeah, this. I've never met Shala yeah. in real life. Worked with her oh, for three cool. years. Never met her in life. Yep. Nice. Just so. know for it's going to be interesting. So I've been like, you're also going to have a beard. No, oh. <laughs> maybe no, no. no. but I, okay. I'll be flying in from uh, Korea. So what I started doing was working out so I can build up my endurance because those two weeks are going to be crazy. Oh, oh yeah. No, I cannot tell, imagine having to tell Ben why you're in Korea. Before. Oh, okay. So yeah, I am a AWS community builder second year. And so yep. uh, I saw something come through on the channels and basically I, I put in an application where I did get one of the ones to be selected where AWS working with Riot Games and then putting oh, cool. on the League of Legends worlds. So I get to go there and then go behind the scenes and, you know, interview their tech leads and stuff and see like that how is they very cool. put all that together. Yeah. So that I'm is excited. super exciting. Yeah. yeah. And she speaks Korean, so she yeah. is going to be also right at home cool. hanging out with these people. So, yeah, yeah it, it's like, this is what second level. My final final exam is in two weeks, as a matter of fact. Hmm. Nice. You're going to you're going to knock it out of the park. So she is doing That's in so South exciting. Korea what Fiedler and Tarbox did in L.A., the, uh, the behind the scenes riot thing for League of Legends. With, uh, oh. yeah, or was it Valorant? Was it Valorant or whatever? Did they do, did they do a different game? I, th I thought I it was League of Legends as well. I think so. The one that was, was in, in LA. Yeah. The one in LA, uh, if it's the one I'm thinking about, that one was for their other game, which is like another big deal. Ah, gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. You know what? I, I need to stop. I need to stop recording. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Have a wonderful evening.